Your team is asking you to deliver a developer platform to increase Kubernetes adoption among your development teams. But you want to make sure you deliver a solution that developers will use, security will like, and that will reduce the burden on the DevOps or platform engineering team, ultimately on you. So let's discuss a few different approaches we see teams taking when building their internal developer platforms or IDPs. The best way to understand some of the benefits and, and challenges around um, the approach of building uh, an internal developer platform or IDP is, is to tell a short story, right? Because it, it lays out two different approaches. Here we have John, who is uh, the lead DevOps engineer at Acme Corporation. And on the other side, we have Brian, who is the application development manager, right? They both have been exploring the idea of building an internal developer platform and the goals are to increase the application deployment velocity, uh, give developers a self-service uh, portal or capabilities where they can basically deploy and manage their own apps, which should increase the developer productivity and reduce the burden on the DevOps team, right? So John starts basically building that IDP, right? He selects a Kubernetes cluster. Maybe he uses one of the managed cloud providers AKS, GKE, EKS, doesn't really matter. He's, he's spinning up a cluster there. But he realizes that for Brian and his team to be able to deploy the apps and really consume that infrastructure, Kubernetes by itself, it's, it's definitely not enough. So John starts building the required components, right? He brings in monitoring, he brings in our back configuration, network policies, and he starts looking at how to integrate this new platform or a series of components into existing pipelines and so on. And as John spends time and starts building this, John realizes that he is now responsible for maintaining several independent projects. Maybe some of these projects are open source, um, and other ones are commercials, but he's now trying to glue this all together and he's now responsible for a series of independent projects and, and resources that he is now supporting and maintaining and getting calls and support tickets and so on. So it adds more to John's play, right? Not only that, but John now realizes that on the previous world where he would basically create a policy on AWS or vCenter around network policy, storage, resource consumption, and he would bind that to a VM, Kubernetes becomes super tricky, right? It's a lot of moving components. You have to learn maybe regal policies and, and implement infrastructure related governance policies, which maybe on the first few services, it's okay, but then later, when the when Brian team starts scaling, John knows that he will run into scalability problems and this will become super complex and not delivering properly on that can basically compromise John's um, performance and role in the organization. Because this thing is growing um, like a Frankenstein, it becomes super hard for John now to actually migrate cluster versions, add a new provider and actually scale or upgrade that infrastructure. John knows that with uh, these many moving pieces, it becomes super risky for them. And last but not least, John knows that he has a lot of existing infrastructure, right? John still, as much as he likes the idea of moving to Kubernetes, he understands that there is still a lot of VM sitting around in the cloud or locally. So how can he actually manage this whole thing? Because the platform he's building now, it's geared towards Kubernetes only, which adds one more huge component for him. But John keeps working on it, and after months putting this all together, John gives um, Kubernetes access to Brian and his team. And as soon as Brian and his team starts deploying services and applications, they realize that it's no longer only about the application code itself, but now they have to learn Kubernetes, they have to learn deployments, architecture, ingress, pods, they have to learn kubectl. So it introduced a lot of infrastructure related resource and, and requirements to the application development team. And they started out pushing Brian and saying, hey, if we have to create and maintain uh, all these infrastructure related objects and every time there's a new API version or a new cluster or a new component that John and the DevOps team chooses, we have to maintain and change all these things. 
So, hey, there's no clear responsibility here, right, of, uh, of, of the vision of roles and responsibilities. So how can we deal with that? Because it introduced a lot on our side. And now Brian starts going back to John and saying, hey, John, whatever you guys are putting together, it doesn't work, right? We need a developer platform where my developers can focus on building the application, no matter if you folks choose AKS or EKS version 119 or 120. For us, it doesn't really matter. We deliver value at the application layer. And my team now, John, they cannot support the application properly, right? Maybe the first few services, it was okay. But now that we're deploying dozens or maybe hundreds of services, now my team cannot support this thing. It's hard for them to understand the relationship between the objects, network, service-to-service uh, -service communication, logs, and so on. So, hey, John, we need more of the DevOps team to support us because we cannot do that. Even though there's a whole shift left, we need your help, right? And last but not least, my team is super tired of Helm charts, customized and boilerplate templates. Every time there is a new service type that we need to deploy or there is a new application, we need to create all these things over and over again or change these scripts, right? So here's John. One year after he started building the platform, he's still going. It's not ready. He's frustrated. And now he realizes the solution is way too complex to maintain and scale. And at the end of the day, it just added a whole lot of workloads for John and his team to support and manage not only the, the existing uh, infrastructure, but now this developer platform, which is super complex. And now because developers cannot properly support their applications, it's up to John to help developers in the applications. Brian is not happy. Brian's team is not happy. His team is giving hit because um, um, Brian needs to work with John to figure out something better. So definitely not happy there. And now the business is questioning the value of the initiative, right? At the end of the day, the business wants to focus on the end goal. If it's a bank, it's basically serving their end users and so on. And for the business, just pouring money and time and more resources into that initiative, if it's not moving super well, the business starts now questioning John on the initiative. On the development side, you have Brian and his team, which they can't stand to YAML anymore, right? Every time they go to John and they ask for help, John throws another YAML at them or uh, John throws another Helm chart at them and say, this now will fix your problem. Or maybe let me pull another CNCF component out of the 1,347 components that we have in there and that might solve the problem. So Brian and his team are frustrated, right? They can't properly deploy their applications at scale without complexity. They, they're having trouble managing the app and so on. So that's where um, Acme today is, right? They're still trying to figure out their problem and they're probably going to go for another one or two years trying to figure this out, if ever. And on the other side of the street, you have the same initiative, um, but now it's a Dunder Mufflin. Not sure if you ever heard of them, but you have Josep, who is the DevOps engineer there, and you have Julie. They want to achieve exactly the same things um, at Dunder Mufflin. But before Josep starts, he starts looking and saying, hey, for me to be successful, I need to give Julie a developer platform right, where for them, it doesn't really matter if I choose AKS, GKE, if I change versions, or if I'm using VMware, VMs, or EC2 VMs. For Julie to be successful with her team, she needs to have a developer platform where they can deploy and manage their own services and applications without being impacted by the infrastructure. But at the same time, while I need to enable them to do that, I need to put some controls, right? At the end of the day, the business is gonna come to me or Giuseppe and ask for controls and governance and policies that are being enforced and audited and so on. So I need to make sure that whatever I give them can go through that policy engine and governance layer. So he starts thinking about it, right? What's the best approach to deploying? And that's where a framework comes in. So instead of Giuseppe trying to actually bring in several Kubernetes clusters and start implementing a lot of monitoring, RBAC, policies, scans, and, and, and try to integrate into CI pipeline and so on and so forth, he thought of building, uh, bringing a framework in place that he can connect to any Kubernetes cluster that he chooses. And it will allow him to basically build governance control around network, resource consumption, registry controls, and so and application um, deployments, and so on, it will come with pre-built integrations. So Giuseppe can quickly deliver value to Julie, right, around monitoring, incident management, integration, integration into CI pipelines and other tools. And also, he wants to give Julie and his team on the DevOps side as well easy-to-consume components, right? 
we understand that network, for example, uh, policies on Kubernetes is extremely complicated, especially if you start kind of giving developers some uh, um, uh, some functionalities around it. So he needs to give Julie and her team something that is easy for them to consume. And last but not least, Giuseppe also understand that he has existing infrastructure. So for him to be successful in the organization, he needs to deliver that framework in a way that it can actually be laid on top of existing infrastructure, no matter if it's a VMware uh, virtual machine or if it's an EC2 or Google or Azure VM, but the framework layer that he defines can apply all these things ac uh, across governance control, integration, consume resources across whatever infrastructure he chooses without impacting Julie. On Julie's side, instead of having the same problem that she had with Brian, where Brian's team had to interact directly with Kubernetes, Julie's team actually, instead of seeing Kubernetes directly, they interact with uh, with with that framework layer, with uh, with Shipa in this case, which allows Julie and her team basically to deploy and observe and support uh, their applications without knowing if Giuseppe chose GKE, AKS, EKS, or if it's an EC2 machine. They're deploying application code and application container images if they want, and they get full visibility post deployment on which developers on Julie's team deployed what and when was it through uh, maybe a GitOps or, uh, or, or another CI pipeline. They can easily integrate into their existing monitoring tools. They can easily integrate into their incident management tools, Slack and so on. So Julie and her team is really now being productive and focused on the application using that framework layer. They don't need to see kubectl anymore because they don't need to interact with that. And everything that Julie and her team deploys through that framework gets the governance controls applied and it, it's scalable across whatever infrastructure Giuseppe chooses, right? So it's it's a huge win for Julie and her team. And how did Giuseppe start actually doing that? Giuseppe went it through um, apps.chipa.cloud, created an account there. And the first thing Giuseppe did was he went to the frameworks page. He created a framework where he defined um, resource consumption, access control, application quota, and so on and so forth. And he bound that framework to an existing cluster he has, whatever cluster for the story, GKE or AKS, for example. But because he was feeling adventurous, he actually creates a framework B, let's say framework now for production or development with a complete set, different set of configurations around resource, network policy, security scans, and so on. And he binds that to an EC2 machine, to an existing Linux machine. And now what happens is he just goes, Giuseppe goes back to Julie and say, hey, the only thing you need to start consuming this is you go to your CI pipeline, no matter if you're using GitHub Actions, Jenkins, or others, your CI pipeline will do its job, will run the tests, will run the build. At the end, when it runs the build, for example, Julie, you just tell your developers to point that image to that Shipa framework. And as a CI finishes the build and sends that image to the Shipa framework, the Shipa framework automatically enforces all the controls, all the policies, the resources, and so on and so forth, validates that whoever in Julie's team is deployed can actually deploy. If it's on a Kubernetes cluster, it automatically creates all the objects and so on, or if it's on a CEC2 machine, it creates all the required objects to run that exact same application in, EC2, in an EC2 machine. And it automatically creates and populates Shipa's dashboard, right? Where Giuseppe can see everything that is happening. His controls, reports, audit, and so on. And he can go back to his business and show that. At the same time that Julie gets a portal where she, uh, where Julie and her team, they can operate their applications. They can see object dependency map, network dependency map, integration into incident management, and so on, which is awesome for Julie and the team. At the end of the day, Giuseppe delivered an IDP in five minutes, different from John, unfortunately, who was probably still. And Giuseppe can quickly enforce governance and controls across a scalable platform. No, really, It doesn't really matter if Giuseppe is using GK or AKS version 119 or 120, or if he's using an EC2 machine, he's enforcing the same governance and control policies and framework across a scalable platform. And last but not least for Giuseppe, his boss is happy with the result, the business is happy with the result, and they all recognize him for delivering such amazing results so quickly.
on the development team, Julie now is happy because her team can operate their apps independently, right? And she doesn't need to deal with Kubernetes. Her team doesn't need to deal with Kubernetes. If they want to learn it, it's great. Learning is power, but they focus on the application. And that's driving them to deliver more applications and support their applications better and driving developer productivity up. At the end of the day, Julie thinks Giuseppe is awesome and she loves working with him. And the moral of the story is don't be like John, right? Be like Giuseppe. Deliver value quickly, get your developers productive, and get your governance and controls applied across not only Kubernetes, but across the existing infrastructure you have. Get your skills up, learn something new, but enable your organization to move fast. Thanks.